Christmas season is here. Christmas is upon us. It is in, on Tuesday. And so we are here on Christmas and then Christmas Eve tomorrow. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be digging in to the birth narratives. And there are two main sections of birth narratives in the scripture. Matthew 1 and of course in Luke chapter 1 and 2. And we're going to be digging in to Matthew 1 and 2. Matthew 1 this morning, Matthew 2 tomorrow night in our Christmas Eve services. And this is an opportunity for us to just come and say, Lord Jesus, who are you? Why did you Come And what have we turned Christmas into? Do we have a clear understanding of why we celebrate in this particular season? I want to draw your attention to the screen. I want to begin with a quote that really just impacted me from Paul David Tripp. The coming of the infant king means the gracious destruction of the kingdom of self and a loving welcome to the kingdom of God. I want you to think about this for just a moment. I want you to think about the words that he uses. I want you to think about the description that he gives and the unusual use of grace. Because we don't usually combine this idea of grace and destruction with one another. This idea of a gracious destruction of the kingdom of self. Jesus came to do what? To redeem and to restore He came to change us, to not leave us as we are, to change us in the here and now and to usher us into his eternal kingdom. And if you think about this season and the way that we try to reinvent ourselves or we try to become better and the majority of Christmas movies and specials and books are about a transformation. One of the most famous ones, A Christmas Carol, where we meet a a character named Ebenezer Scrooge. Charles Dickens wrote this in the 1840s. And you know this story. I guarantee you, none of you in this room have actually read the book, but you have seen the movie. You know what I'm saying? And you know it. You know who you are. I'm right there with you. But we meet Ebenezer Scrooge. And what's what's Scrooge's problem? He is cold-hearted. He's greedy. He is everything that we don't want to become. How does he go through... A transformation. How does his life change? Not through a gracious destruction, but actually through condemnation. He visits the, past, the regrets of his past. He gets and he feels the shame of his present. And then he also gets the fear of a future. He changes because of fear. But the story is short-lived. We get just a glimpse, a little picture. It's fictional. We don't get to see and experience a life change. I mean, a true transformation to where we are literally not the old, but the new has come. Jesus did not come to make us feel warm and fuzzy and to drink cider. He came to save us. And so as we enter into the scripture, remember that Jesus is a king. And he is entering in humbly in order to save us from our sin. So if you join me this morning, Matthew chapter 1, and if you stand in the honor of God's word this morning, Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18. Matthew is writing, and he writes this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we come to you. And Lord, you are drawing us near. You are speaking this morning through your word. Lord Jesus, may we hear you. Father, may we know you. Lord Jesus, may we follow you this morning. Lord Jesus, change us 
change us. Change our hearts, change our minds, change our ways, change our attitude, transform us. Lord Jesus, may we surrender all to you this morning and to experience the full of your presence and your power. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to begin actually all the way back in verse number one, where it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In the very first 24 verses, Matthew records the line of Jesus, the line specifically belonging to Joseph, his legal father, obviously not his physical father, but his legal line. And Matthew has a very specific purpose in doing this. Because if you look at the very first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, there's a specific order to what Matthew wants us to see. Why do we know this? Because David does not come before Abraham. In the chronology of things, in the way they have been raised and lived, Abraham lives way before David. So what is Matthew getting at when he includes David first prior to Abraham? Abraham. The first thing that Matthew is trying to communicate to us is that Jesus is a king. His line is royal because there was a promise that there was going to one who was going to come in the line of David. And Matthew is very clear. Don't miss this. This is the promised deliverer. This is the promised Messiah. And he comes in the line of David. His line is royal. And not only is it royal, but he is coming to do what? Fulfill a promise. That is why Abraham is mentioned. That's why the genealogy begins with Abraham. Because in Genesis chapter 12, a promise was given to Abraham that he was named would be made great. That a great nation would be formed in and through him. And that a deliverer would come in and through him to fulfill a promise. God is a keeper of promises. He's made a promise to deliver, to form a nation, to form a people, to bring redemption, to bring restoration. And he is fulfilling this promise. And the line, the genealogy, shows the faithfulness of God. That he overcomes our faithlessness in order to fulfill a promise. And so you have the line of David, meaning that it's royal. You have the son of Abraham, which means he's fulfilling a promise. And the rest of the names of which I can't even pronounce anyway, so we're not even gonna dig into it, right? You can feel me on that, right? And so as we walk through that line of names, we see very clearly the mission of God. We see his redemption, we see his restoration. Because when you really begin to dig into the names and just briefly, some of the names that are mentioned in this genealogy up on the screen here for you, there's some rough stories. Abraham, Abraham was a liar. Abraham did not fully trust a God's word and even lied at times. Jacob, Jacob was a thief. Jacob stole the birthright from his own brother and he was a liar also. And God wrestled with Jacob. Here we have the story of Judah and Tamar. If you think your family screwed up, just read that story. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, there is some crazy stuff happening in the Bible and you're like, God, you're using these people? I mean, I thought they had to be cleaned up. No, 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 no. You think your family's dysfunctional? Go read that story. Rahab was a prostitute in scripture. She was one who lied, who hid the spies, and she was known as Rahab the prostitute. And God is taking his line, the Messiah, directly through her. Think about that for a moment. Redemption and restoration. And then you have David, revered. Where does his line continue? Through an illicit relationship, through wife of Uriah, known as Bathsheba, Solomon comes through this dysfunctional relationship and the Lord continues to show his faithfulness even though we are faithless. So when we come to this story, when we come to the account of the arrival of the king, see that the Lord has come to do what? Bring transformation, to bring redemption, to bring restoration. These people are not perfect. We are not perfect. And we as imperfect people have to meet the perfect king for us to be changed. And he came to save. Don't miss this. As we dig into this account, 
The names that are given for God, the names that are given to him are very important and they communicate very clearly his line is royal, that he's come to fulfill a promise and that he has come with a very specific mission. Let's dig back in. Verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, here's the key, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means God saves, Jehovah saves. Saves us from what? And here comes the reality. Saves us from sin. You see, this makes no sense. Carries absolutely no meaning nor weight to us until we understand that we are sinners, that we need a deliverer. We need a savior. We are all sinners in this room, every one of us. The word that's translated to sin means to miss the mark. Every one of us have attempted to hit perfection and every one of us have missed it. Every one of us have rebelled. Every one of us have failed. We are all in the same situation and we're carrying around this baggage. We're carrying around this sin and we're saying, what do we do with this? What do we do with these past regrets? What do I do with these horrible decisions? What do I do with all of this baggage that I'm carrying around? There's a great story of a total trash truck barrier, a boat called the Cayenne Sea back in 1986, because I think we do this with sin a lot in our world. There was, it was loaded up with 14,000 tons of trash from the city of Philadelphia. This is why it put a lot of interest to me, right? And so over the next 16 months, this ship goes throughout the entire world trying to find a place to dump its trash. Man, they go to places like Panama, Bermuda. They go to places like Dutch Antilles, Dominican Republic, Honduras. Nobody's going to take their trash. So in 1988, they dump about 4,000 tons of it in Haiti because they re-termed the trash as fertilizer. I mean, have you ever done this? You ever done this with your sin? Man, if I just give it a new name, if I just call it something different, then it won't be as bad and I will try to cover up what it actually is. And so we try to give our sins new names and we try to invent new theories and reasons for why we are and not accepting the fact that we are failures. But they, people caught on and they caught on with this ship and so they continued on in their journey going to Senegal, Morocco, Yugoslavia, trying to find different ways to dump their trash, even changing the name of the ship twice in order to find a place to dump it. And in 1988, somehow magically, they goes out to sea in the Pacific Ocean and somehow comes back with no trash. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what happened, right? And all of a sudden, all kinds of stories. We don't even know what happened to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and this is what we do. We, we, we get into this fictitious world. Prosecution comes, obviously, in 1993. Our sin is destroying us. And we're trying to find places to dump it. We're trying to find ways to get rid of it. We're trying to find ways to forget. And it doesn't work that way. We are sinners. And there's only one who has come and who has the power to take away our sins. I want you to think about this for a moment. Let the weight hit you. Forgiveness is only in one. And when I mean forgiveness, we're talking a complete cleaning of the slate. Past, present, and future. That he has come to pay our price. He has come to take away the sins of the world. He has come to pay our 
price. He has entered in with a very specific mission. And that mission is the forgiveness of sin and his very presence. Take a look at verse number 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I mean, that verse, that promise came at a time of great dysfunction. Isaiah 7, 14 is where it is given. And it's given in the reign of a king named Ahaz, who is in the line of David. And he's in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. And he was an evil king. He was so evil that he rebelled against God, did not worship God. In fact, looked to find his solution in things outside of God. It was so evil, known as one of the most evil kings that ever existed. And in the midst of his reign, in the midst of his dysfunction, here comes this promise. Once again, God's faithfulness trumps our faithlessness. A promise of his presence is given in the most dysfunctional, horrible time in the history of the world. And there's a promise of a rightful king, a promise of a good and perfect king. And God himself is our king. And the incarnation is not a sham. It is not something that Jesus decided to take a vacation with us for a while here on earth. That's not what it is. He literally became one of us. Turn over in your Bibles if you haven't to Philippians chapter 2. And I just want you to hear the fullness of God becoming man. Beginning in Philippians chapter 2 verse number 3. Up on the screen for you. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here's the key. Who, all, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God did not try to grasp, meaning he didn't try to hold on to something in order to save himself. He gave it up. He set it aside so that we could live. He humbled himself. He humbled himself and became one of us. Now, I know that's hard for us to imagine because we think we're so great. Guess what? We're not. You know what I'm saying? And he is. But he humbled himself and came here legitimately. Came here and became one of us. God and man joined together in one person named Jesus so that we would know him. He's Emmanuel. That's a title that he carries. God with us. Think about this for a moment. Let it hit you for a moment. Jesus. In Jesus, we can have the forgiveness of sin and the presence of God. Two things we could never earn. Two things we could never produce on our own. Two things that are, uh, will elude you and only found in him. The forgiveness of sin and the presence of God. And he came for us in that virgin birth. David Platt writes this about the virgin birth, which is key, coming back to him and who he is. Part of the purpose of the virgin birth of Jesus is to show us that salvation does not come from man, but from God. Salvation is wholly the work of a supernatural God, not the work of natural man. He came as a, in the virgin birth because, because it's all about him, because it's all God. It's not us. This is not something we made up. This is not something we've invented. This is the reality of him coming for us. Now, the question is, in the midst of this good news, what do we do with it? That's where the rub comes into place. That's where this whole thing comes right face to face with us. What do we do? And that is so why it's so important for us to spend some time with Joseph. Joseph is not unlike you or me. Humble guy, just wants to get married. You know what I'm saying? He's betrothed. That word betrothed means it's stronger than our getting engaged. I mean, there was a covenant formed between the two of them. He was so excited. He found his wife in Mary. And then there comes that moment where Mary pulls him inside and says, hey, Joseph, I'm pregnant. But it's okay. It's from the Holy Spirit. I mean, can you imagine this moment? Let's feel the weight of this for just a moment. 
you're super excited about being married, and your wife comes to you, your to-be wife comes to you and says, hey, I'm pregnant, but it's okay, man, the Holy Spirit. I mean, like, God spoke to me. What would your reaction be? Uh, yeah, okay, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't born yesterday. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how this thing works. Like, what, no way. And this is Joseph hearing these words. This is where he's wrestling and struggling. Look at the scripture. Look what happens here in the scripture where it says in verse number 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. You see, I think it's pretty obvious to you that Joseph really does love Mary, really wants the best for her because it was in his legal right to shame her publicly, to have her put to death if he so chose. And he, being a just man, wanted to do it quietly, but he still wanted to do what? He still wanted to control his life. He still wanted to make it right. He still wanted to have all that he planned to have. And if it wasn't going to work out with Mary, it was going to work out with somebody else. And so he took it upon himself to make his life what he wanted it to be. But what happened? God really was at work. God really was doing these things. And God intervened. Take a look at verse number 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And jump down to verse number 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. What happened in this moment? God intervened in his life. Exactly what he does with us. Because what did God do to Joseph? He gave him a revelation. He spoke to him. He gave him a clarity about exactly what is happening and why it is happening. Exactly what God does to us in and through his word. Don't miss this. God is still speaking. He's still revealing. He's still intervening into our lives. And he's showing us. What is he showing us? He's at work. He's doing it. And he wants us to be a part of all that he is doing. And he intervened into Joseph's life as he intervenes in our lives. And he speaks to us. And he calls us to himself. And he wants to redeem and restore And when he spoke to Joseph, and when Joseph heard from the Lord, he was instructed from the Lord, what was his reaction? He obeyed. He believed. That's the same reaction that we are called upon to have. We are called upon to believe. We are called upon to obey. No matter how outrageous it may seem to those around you, no matter how outrageous it is to your family or your friends or your colleagues, it doesn't matter. God is speaking. He's calling you and he's saying, I want to save you. I want to forgive you. I want to change you. This invasion of God, the incarnation, is coming as the rightful king. He is the rightful king. We are not. And he's come to graciously graciously, not with condemnation, graciously invite us into his kingdom because he loves you and me. And he calls upon us to believe, to believe and to trust him. And there's some of us who are here in this room, we've been in this room a long time, but we have yet to truly believe and trust him. We have not obeyed the command of the Lord. We have not followed his instructions. And Joseph doesn't have all the answers in the world, but he knows what God has said to him. And he went and he obeyed. The question is, what is one area in your life right now? You know, God is speaking to you and he's calling upon you right now to obey, to follow him, to believe. Because every one of us in this room, we 
need Jesus. And he is readily available. And he has come for us. The story of Christmas is not a little warm fuzzies, all right? Not from warm fuzzies. It's about the king showing up and saying, I've come for you. I've come to pay your price. And he was so humble. What's it say according to scripture? According to Philippians 2, what's it say? He was so humble that he went and he humbled himself to the point of death. Even death, what? On a cross. Shameful. Shameful death. And that's why the scripture says in Philippians 2, as it continues, not up on the screen for you, but Philippians 2 verse 9 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so what is the resp- proper response to Christmas? It's called worship. It's worship. Because his name is above every name, Jesus. There's salvation in only one name, it's Jesus. We are called upon to obey and follow only one, his name is Jesus. And the question is, do we believe? Are we following? Are we ready to give it all up? Are we ready to turn it all over? Are we ready to say, Lord Jesus, I can't carry this trash anymore. I don't care what I call it. I don't care where I try to put it. It's still trash. I can't get rid of it. There's only one who can forgive sin. There's only one who can change us. There's only one who can give us the gift of eternal life, and his name is Jesus. And the question is, do you believe? Will you follow? Will you let him change your life? Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And Lord Jesus, we come to you, all of us who are hurting. We come to you, Lord Jesus, with great dysfunction, sin, sin that we've tried to hide, things that are hurting us. Father, we know, you know. And Lord Jesus, we need your forgiveness. Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that Lord, you will give us the courage as Joseph had the courage to respond to you in obedience, to believe and to obey. With all heads bowed and all heads closed this morning, there are some of you who are here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never turned it all over to him. And the Lord Jesus is calling upon you right now to surrender to him for the very first time. There are some of you who are here and you've called upon Jesus to save. But yet for whatever reason, you have walked away. You've rebelled. Things have grown cold. It's time to let the Lord restore you this morning. There are those who are here this morning and you need redemption for the very first time. There are some of you who are here this morning and you need restoration and let the Lord change you, change you because he has the power to do it and he came to do it. Father, give us the strength this morning to respond to you, to believe and to obey. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus.